first, I want to pray. So let's uh, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll we'll dive in. Lord, what a privilege it is to be your children, to be called by grace, to be adopted into your family and grafted into the line of the faithful down through the centuries. And we thank we thank you for the opportunity this morning to be in your word and to draw strength from examples of those who have been faithful before us. May we, as we hear this and dive into your word today, we, may we be strengthened in faith and bold witnesses for you, Lord Jesus, who died and rose for us, and in whose name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, with your indulgence, I want to... I want to... I, I, for those of you who were in worship upstairs, I kind of gave a teaser for the study. And... I was hoping to get this get to this today and because I was hoping to get to it, I think I'm gonna skip over the other stuff. So we're gonna come back to the extraordinary Abigail probably next week. Um, and we'll come back likely to Hushai in 2 Samuel 17. Um, and I wanna dive right in to 1 Kings chapter 21. So open up your Bibles if you would, 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 21. 1 Kings 21. And just to kind of look at if 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 you have your 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 sheet for part five, um, talk about just some objectives. Um, to recognize our Christian duty to preserve and defend Christ Christ's word and honor. Number two, two to confess that the Lord is just and that vengeance belongs to him. There's sometimes a tension there. Um, to understand, and we talked about this last week, that faithfulness is always rewarded by God, but it is often not safe. And to that end, let's look at the example of Naboth. If I could have a reader for verses 1 through 4. Any red volunteer? Aiden, you're 1 through 4. Paul, if you would, I'm going to have you take 5 through 7. Do I have a reader beginning at verse 8 for that next paragraph? Blaine, so you've got 8 through 14, and I need, um, and then somebody at, at 15 through 16, somebody else willing to do that? 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 21. Okay. Dorothy, so you got 1 Kings 21, 15 to 16. Now I need uh, 17 to 19. Rachel, you got 17 to 19. Um, somebody over here willing to do beginning at verse 20? Going once? Jill, all right, thank you. All right, so 1 Kings 21 beginning at verse 20. And then uh, that final section, let's do, let's do um, 25 to 28. Does anybody? I think Dave, so you got it? Okay. All right. All right. So um, what I'd like to do, so keep your ears open. I want to, I, I, what I'd like to do is read through it and then come back and talk about it. Okay. There's a if you don't if you don't do this by the way regularly I really encourage it to read out loud and to read big chunks um, or if you I also recommend if you don't have an audio Bible I encourage you to get an audio Bible and there's something about being read too but there's a power in reading out loud even even if you're retired and widowed or a widower um, it's reading out loud. And hear and hearing it and hearing it in big chunks. Read a chapter or two or three at a time for the context. Okay, I'll come back to the image on the screen later. All right, first, or excuse me, First Kings chapter twenty-one, beginning at verse one. Who's got that? Eight. Fire away. Now Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of Ahab, the king of Samaria. And after this, Ahab said to Naboth, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near my house, and I will give you a better vineyard for it. Or, if it seems good to you, I will give, give you its value in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, 
The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. And Ahab went into his house vexed and sullen because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. <laughs> That's a kind of a nice little fit for a king, isn't it? <laughs> right? So, beginning at verse 5. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so vexed that you eat no food? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it please you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. And Jezebel and his wife said to him, Do you now govern Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, and sealed them with a seal. And she sent the letters to the elders and leaders who lived with Naboth in the city. And she wrote in the letters, Proclaim a fast, and set Naboth at the head of the people, and set two worthless men opposite him. And let him bring a charge against and let them bring a charge against him, saying, You have cursed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. And the men of this of his city, the elders and the leaders who lived in his city, did as Jezebel had sent word to them. As it is written in the letters that she had sent to them, they proclaimed a fast and set Naboth at the head of the people. And the two worthless men came in and sat opposite them. And the worthless men brought a charge against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth, curse God and the king. And they took him outside the city and stoned him to death with stones. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth, and the stone is his death. Okay, verse 15. <laughs> there you go. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, and such a life which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. And as soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab arose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, which was there, and take possession of it. Okay. 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall say to him, Thus that says the Lord, In the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick your own blood. Ahab said to Elijah, So you have found me, my enemy. I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. I am going to bring disaster on you. I will consume your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Naboth, and that of Basha, son of Ahijah, because you have provoked me to anger and have caused Israel to sin. And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord says, dogs will devour Jezebel, Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and the birds of the air will feed on those who die in the country. Okay, 25 and following. There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He acted very abominably in going after idols, as the Amorites had done, whom the Lord cast out before the people of Israel. And when Ahab heard those words, he tore his clothes, and put sackcloth on his flesh, and fasted, and laid in sackcloth, and went about dejectedly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring disaster in his days. But in his son's days, I will bring disaster upon his house. All right. So, what did Ahab want at the beginning? The vineyard which belonged to Naboth. Now, if you flip back in your Bible a little bit, 
Ahab, good king or total moron? Unfaithful, idol worshiping, deceitful, despicable, terrible man. Total moron is generous. Total moron is generous. Um, yes, I probably shouldn't use that word. Um, but the, so, so Ahab tells Naboth, I want your vineyard and I'll pay you for it. Let's, let's assume they offered him a fair price. What did Naboth say? Not under any condition, right? We are going to come back to this when we get into, ultimately we're, we're getting toward looking at the text of the Magdeburg Confession. Uh, confession. There are some times, under no condition, do you submit. And we want to think that when we do that, that the Lord will reward us. So what happened then to Naboth? Well, let, let, so let's, re, let's retell the story a little bit for the sake of maybe those who are watching on YouTube and couldn't quite hear us. So what, what then happened next? Who got involved? Jezebel. Jezebel. And she is a sweet and gracious oh. queen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he jumped out. Right? What does Jezebel do? First lady. She schemes to get... And how does, how does she scheme? How does she do this? She frames him. She brings false witnesses. Does this sound? She does it for it, right? She brings false witnesses. She arranges this whole scenario. Does this sound like somebody that you know around AD 33? Right? Bad girl. I won't repeat that. That's a big <laughs> so, a kangaroo trumped up charges are arranged. Naboth, a righteous man who would not submit to, would not allow his property to come into the possession of this evil, despicable man. Then what happens? How, how does Naboth die? So, Nice, kind, kind of gentle. Stone him to death. They stone him to death. And then what happens? Naboth takes over the land. Then, well, excuse me, Aboth takes over. Yeah, Ahab takes over the land. Then, then what happens? There's another important person in the scriptures who get involved here. Elijah the prophet enters. If you flip back in your Bible a little bit, you'll have seen a lot of back and forth between Elijah and these despicable king and his wife. And what does the Lord call Elijah to do? Confronts Ahab. And how does he do this? What, is, what does he say? You are a murderer. What, what you now in his office as king as king when he, you know, when his wife let, let's you know when his wife did what she did, what should have happened? As the as you can't answer, right? <laughs> right? What what should have what should have happened? Should have confronted his wife. Not just no. Confronted. But this was yeah, I mean, she orchestrated. Now, of course, he was kind of, but this is kind of like um, entirely blaming Eve yeah. for the original sin, right? Um, you know, and, and Paul calls in Romans five, right? Paul calls Adam to task, as it were, for that. So they're both involved. But what should have happened is right, there should have been discipline. Um, 
but that doesn't happen. So what then does Eli Elijah confronts him? And what, what happens when the prophet Elijah confronts this despicable king? What happens? He told him that. He told him that um, in the place where God, God slipped up the blood of man, so God slipped up your own blood. Yeah, you're going to die. I mean, and this is a disgraceful way to, right, to have dogs eat at your carcass is a, is a, is a despicable, um, what's the word I'm searching for, humiliating uh, way to die and to, and, and to have your remains, right? Because the body is, the bo it, it, you were talking about where the Jews, the body is sacred. By the way, I, I heard there's a bill, but, and I'm going to, as an aside here, I heard there's a bill in Wisconsin, if I heard this, that just passed a Somewhere, I, I, forgive me if I heard this. Let's go into the assembly. That that a body can be dissolved and poured in the sewer system. Oh. Friends, get involved. Call Barb Dietrich. Do not let this happen. There's a there's a bill in Wisconsin right now that will allow the allow chemical that, that a body would be able to be dissolved. We, 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 friends, this is also great at the risk of offending many of you. Historically, why Christians don't cremate is because we're not pagans. And I'm sorry this, if it, this offends you, but paganism cremates and just returns us to the whole circle of life. Historically, we bury our bodies because the promise of the resurrection of the body. And yes, it can become expensive, but this is why... I'm sorry if that's offends you, but this is one of the things historically that we, we historically have not done cremation because that's what pagans did, and they believed in this whole circle of life and death thing. We believe in the resurrection of the body, and so we, like our Jewish forebears, have always buried our bodies. Friends, contact your right. This is an abomination that a body could be dissolved and enter the sewer system. I, Get involved. Um, what was the state's justification? I have absolutely no idea. I have no idea what the justification is. Um, it's just it's terrible. Anyway, I'm sorry for the aside. Um, but it, it's kind of mildly related to what we'll talk about. So Elijah confronts Ahab. What does Ahab do? What, is, what does Ahab do? The, the despicable king. What does he do? He humbles. He humbles himself and 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 repents of sorts. And so the Lord hears it. Now this is where you, the will of the Lord gets kind of beyond us. He says, "Okay, you know, Ahab has a has a long history of being a real creep." Um, but the Lord says, okay, I'm not going to have this happen to you in your lifetime, but it's going to happen to your sons and stuff. Right? Um, kind of back to where we are. Did Naboth do the right thing in not selling his vineyard to the wicked to the wicked king? That was the choice. It was his, it was his choice, but... Um, the way the Magdeburgers are later going to use this is there comes a time when you just, when, when somebody is manifestly evil, as Ahab was, you don't participate, you don't in any way. You don't, you don't, you don't submit. Um, and, it, and of course it was his choice, but he, he did it also because I'm not, I'm not I'm, I'm, you know, I might sell my land, but I'm not going to sell it to you, you despicable man who's killed people and gone after the prophets and all this. But do you think that's the case here? I mean, I, he didn't want to sell it to the king. You, he is saying that he won't sell it to the king. His father, my so this is something to pass down. This is, this would disgrace what his fathers have done in a sense by giving it to his third person. Thank you for answering yeah. for me. Yes. So, right, there's, I mean, it also brings disgrace upon his family, so on and so forth. Um, there's sometimes that you don't, you don't bend the knee. Um, 
let me, so now let me switch gears and to begin to tell you about the man I met yesterday and that it, it has impacts all of us. Um, Dwayne, you're an artist. Um, if you didn't know that, by the way, Dwayne Peterson is a, uh, is a potter in his retirement. Um, let's say you have a Jewish friend who is a potter. Um, and someone comes to your Jewish potter friend and says, I want you to make a large pot for me in ornate, in ornate writing. I want you to write on that pot, God hates the Jews. Should your Jewish potter friend have to make that pot? No. Why? Because it's against his belief. <laughs> because it's against his belief. Like Chick-fil-A? Chick if, if, um, like. let's say, let's say you have a, let's say you have a homosexual man who um, is a graphic designer. And somebody from Westboro Baptist Church comes to this man and says, I want you to make for me a sign, a series of signs that say that says, God hates homosexuals. Should the homosexual should the homosexual man have to make that sign? No. What? Isn't it a free country, right? His business is open, why not? So, let me introduce you to Jack Phillips. Now, um, Bill, since you're standing, I'm going to let you pass these around. <laughs> Try not to look at it. Um, Jack Phillips uh, wanted to be an architect, but discovered as he was graduating high school he hadn't done enough math. <laughs> um, and and so, as, as he told us yesterday at the Issues Etc. conference I was at in Chicago, he said, well, then I talked to somebody about, um, I forgot what the second thing was, and um, you know, he could be an artist, and his guidance counselor said, well, you're not going to make any money. Um, and he got a job at a kind of a big kind of commercial bakery. And then the bakery obtained uh, a cake making business, and he, he, he Jack discovered cake decorating. And so he, he ended up making his own cake decorating business called Masterpiece Cake Shop. And um, Jack had apparently been raised kind of, sort of, in a church going family but had really walked away from it. Wasn't got married, wasn't part of his life, wasn't part of his children's life, but something was something happened to him as an adult, which led both he and his wife separately um, to repent of their sinfulness and, and, re, and return to the faith. And they began, and so they started this cake shop. And they said when they started the cake shop that there were That they would, they would, they wouldn't do certain things. They would, you know, that they would, they would, they would serve everyone, but there were some messages that they couldn't convey uh, across a whole spectrum of things. So, yeah, I think it was in 2012, uh, in July of 2012, um, a homosexual couple, male couple, came into his cake shop in uh, Colorado and said, we want you to make for us a cake for our wedding. And Jack, as he tells it, was um, very practiced in this conversation because they, they don't do, you know, they have people come in and they don't, they don't do, for example, they don't do Halloween cakes. And they would have to explain every year in October why they, you know, so they were used to doing this kind of thing. And Jack said, 
you know, I'm, I'm sorry, well, I can do that, but I can't do this particular message because of my religious beliefs. And the guy swore at him, dropped F-bombs in the shop, and, uh, and stormed out. And within hours started receiving phone calls. Constant phone calls. Are you the guy that da 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 da? Um, and also, and including began, and this went on and on and on. I mean, he said he always answered the phone. He had to stop answering the phone. He kept getting phone calls, including one guy who says, I've got my gun. I'm right here in town. I'm headed your direction. I'm going to come in there. I'm going to blow your head off. And then he would call back again and says, now I'm here. I'm getting closer. I'm going to blow your head off. Now, I asked Dorothy for I asked Dorothy for permission to, to use her. Well, yeah. Well, I, I thought of you, right? I thought so. When you when you when you meet Jack Phillips, Jack is just he is a sweet, gentle man. I thought of you, Dorothy. Right? I mean, and some and some others like you. He's just he's not he's not like you know. I'm a I'm a more aggressive. Type A, right? I would be, I would be more forceful. A guy comes into my church and tries to interrupt the preaching of the word and won't get out. I throw him over my shoulder and get him around the building, right? Um, I mean, nobody else did it, so I did. Um, you know, I, and Jack is, Jack is, Jack is very sweet and gentle, and people are calling him and threatening his life because of because of his religious convictions. And he gets sued by some lower court, uh, and I forget the name of it, and it's in your folder, um, in Colorado. And so, so Jack and his wife then have to make a decision. And friends, it is hard uh, to overstate how important this is. And I mean this for every one of us, but there are a few people in the room for whom it would be particularly important. I don't know if I told you this, Pastor Shine. So three years ago, um, I think it was three years ago, you know, every year our eighth graders take their class trip and we go to South Dakota. By the way, if you don't send your kids to St. Paul's, send your kids to St. Paul's. Because um, we do things here that I'm sorry that another other school can't. So send your kids here. Um, on that trip, we just, at Mount Rushmore, we just happened to meet Baronel Stutzman. Baronel Stutzman is this quiet little grandma in Washington State who has owned a florist shop for many, 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 many years. And she serves everyone, but there are some floral messages that she won't do because of her religious beliefs. She was sued, went to the Supreme Court, won, they went after her again. This is now what's happening with Jack Phillips. They are weaponizing the legal system, right, to, for, to force him. So Jack and, his, Jack and his wife made a decision. They said, you know, all right, do we just stop making wedding cakes? Or do we or do we stand up and fight and fight this and say we have the right now? No. What, let's, I want to talk a little bit about what's at stake here. And this hits home deeply for me, and why I asked you guys to be here. If you're an artist, let's say, for example, your name is Phelan O'Donnell, and you can sing, and you have your own studio someday. Kid, okay, this is a big deal. What if somebody, you know, and let's say you have your own business, right, and you teach music or you're teaching voice or something like that, and somebody comes into your office and says, I want you to sing a song <clears throat> that is this long thing about I hate Christ. If Jack Phillips loses, they will be able to force you to sing that. Or you have to shut it off. Or you, Aiden. Or, you know, Blaine, you're marrying my daughter. 
let's say let's say you do what you guys have you and Siobhan have talked about and you're doing your computer thing and ultimately maybe Siobhan opens her shop and she's making stuff. Because this is what's happening to Baron L. Stutzman right now, and it's what what's happening to Jack Phillips. What if you what if at that little shop, which I would imagine you would, Siobhan serves all kinds of people and makes all kinds of things, but somebody comes into the shop and makes wants Siobhan to make something that deeply violates what she believes. And she says, I'm sorry, I can't do that, but I know some other places that would do it for you, which is what Baronel and what Jack have done. But instead, they sue you. And they're not, they're suing you personally. Baronel stuck her retirement, her home, their, their, their entire everything, they're trying to bury it to bury it, right? So, right, this is you. If, if we lose this, I mean, and a photographer, a, gra a, a graphic artist, this is what, you know, sometimes you gotta stand and, you know, and Jack yesterday um, was there with his attorney from the um, Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a Christian defense organization. Because Baronel Stutzman lost the reasons that the Supreme Court refused to hear a recent case, which means they're going to proceed and try and ruin her. I mean, this is going on right now in the United States of America. If, you do, if we don't write our representatives, if we don't stand up for this stuff, if we don't tell the, the Assembly of Wisconsin not to dissolve people like in the matrix. If we don't stand up and do this, we're gonna end up forced to do all our, your children, your grandchildren, your great children are gonna end up in, in a sea of paganism and they can do whatever we want because you know, you know who forces artists to do stuff against their will? You know who does that? Nazis, Lenin, Mao Zedong. Do I sound, I'm not a politician, Ahab. Friends, we cannot be passive about this. We cannot be passive about this. Am I passionate about it? Because my kids' lives are on the line here. I have artists. They're trying to force artists in the United States of America to do things against their will. Now, they do it mostly with Christians. Not really happening among Muslims and others. But we got to stand up for that Muslim artist business owner and for the Christian, right? If we don't, then the government can tell you what to do. And if you don't do it, they will throw you in the can or ruin your life. It's happening right now in the United States of America. Right now. Yes, sir. How does this fit in with conscientious objection, which the military recognizes and accommodates? <clears throat> they're they're actually fighting against a, a policy that I don't know. I would think that would be something that I don't know. You know, because that gives you your right to your faith. Yeah. Well, you, you have a right to your faith, but the, the legal system is starting to make that utterly a private thing that you can't. Now, the First Amendment. You know, anybody know what the First Amendment says? Not just freedom of speech. It's freedom, uh, right? The government shall shall establish no religion, freedom of the press, and shall not restrict the free exercise of religion. You not only get to believe it in your head, but you actually get to practice it. Yes. Right. All so yeah. All all kind all kinds of stuff. And forgive me, you know, for for being boisterous here, but this is going on right now, right? And if you meet, if you met Jack Phillips, if, when you hear about him in the news, or you hear about Bella, Baron L. Stutzman in the news, I want you to think of somebody like Dorothy. And forgive me, right? But Dorothy, I love you, you're, you're sweet and kind, you know? I mean, I'm sure that's not always true, but right? <laughs> I mean, I, I know you'll admit to the Senate, right? But I mean, you're just, you know, I just I was I was looking at Jack up on the stage there, right? And he 
he's just a sweet man who likes, you know, who's likes to make cakes. That, I mean, that's his. He's an artist, and he just chose to do that. Um, yes, ma'am. Well, and here's you know, what, what happens. What I, and what I'm what I'm saying is, and this is why the the example of Naboth is is among others. We will not bend the knee. And friends, this is right. So, Baronel Stutzman uh, told Jack Phillips, who told us yesterday. Baronel told Jack, even though she lost her case, or the Supreme Court wouldn't take her case. So you know, kind of sort of lost. Marinell told Jack, I've won. By, by standing up for Christ, I've met so many wonderful people, including this little group of eighth graders three years ago, that recognized this woman amongst a crowd at Mount Rushmore. And I was just in tears. I grabbed, you know, grab, I remember grabbed Jill, and Jill's kind of looking at me like, What's going on here? <laughs> I, mean, I told the kids, I said, this is one of the most important legal cases in the modern in modern America going on right now. We just happened to cross this one. And we have a picture of mm -hmm. Baronel um, at the foot of Mount Rushmore. Was it under construction at the time? Yes. I, yeah. Um, and you know, I met, so I got to meet Jack Phillips yesterday. Um, so one of the other speakers at the Issues Etc. conference was Dr. Robert George who is um, one of the preeminent legal, conservative legal scholars and public apologists in the United States and thus in the world. They did a Q&A &A, um, with Dr. George, Dr. George made two presentations, you know, making, making the case uh, for the Constitution and for the necessity of civic virtue and so forth, and for standing up. Um, and so during the Q&A, Dr. George was there with Jake Warner from the Alliance Defending Freedom and then Jack Phillips next to him. And they introduced, they introduced the speakers. Now, Robert George, professor at Princeton, one of the most widely regarded men in the United States, sits there in his chair. And he looks like a Princeton man, gray hair. I mean, just, he totally looks like a Princeton man. And he sits there like this. And they give him the mic, and he stands up and he says, now, this is just a little guy, he's talking about a little guy in college. He said, Dr. George, the preeminent legal scholar, one of the preeminent legal scholars in America, he said, stands up and says, and bends over and says, I just want to say what a privilege it is to be on the same stage as a true American hero. And he's referring to this little cake. Um, I wanted you guys to be here today because Jack's doing that for you, for you and your wife, Wayne, for you and for you, for any, for all the things, for you, Wayne, for the, for the, so that we don't become a Nazi, social communist state. Um, and even right, and even if we do, the call the call is like our forefather in the faith, Naboth, and some other who we've met along the way, is not to bend the knee. And it might be when we when we when we don't bend the knee, it might be that in this life the reward the Lord rewards us and sets everything straight. But it might be that somebody makes up trumped up charges or uses the legal system to their advantage and ruins us financially. But that doesn't mean that we don't have the reward. This is what I want to do. Does Naboth have the reward? You bet he does. He died like someone who would come centuries later, a man named Stephen, under a stoning death. He died confident in Christ. And he knew that 
his life were, was not for this alone. And we here we are. Now I'm trying to think what, what year we're talking. What, what are we talking? 600 years, 800 years? I'm trying to think. In the first came somebody looking at the Bible I'm trying to remember my dates. Here we are 2,500 plus lit years later. And who are we talking about this morning? A man named Naboth. Who stood up and was counted among the faithful. Isn't that cool? Has Naboth won the reward? I mean, he may have he may have died. Think about a woman named Mary Magdalene, who poured this expensive ointment at the feet of Jesus, and they scolded her for it. What did what did Je what did Jesus say? I can't I'm thinking of the exact reference right now. This what she has done will be told in memory of her. And here we are, two thousand years later talking about this woman who loved Jesus, right, and anointed him with an expensive right, fragrance because she knew who he was. Friends, write Barb Dietrich, or your representative, your assembly members. Write your state senator, write the governor. Stand up for the rights of others to speak their conscience, whether they agree with us in faith or not. And when you have the opportunity to give witness for the hope that it was in you, that is in you because of Jesus Christ, give that answer with gentleness and respect. This is what Jack Phillips does every time he gets an angry phone call. And he gets them all the time, relentlessly. People call him threat. Be ready for it. Give the hopeful answer. And I promise you in the Lord, I promise you in the Lord, because this is the Lord's promise, that He will hear you and He will reward you. It may not be in this life, right? But He hears prayers of the righteous. And so let's get about it. Let's get, let's get about it. Some of us are going up to worship in a few minutes. Let's sing so the people out walking outside can hear. For those of us going home, right? Write that letter. Befriend your neighbor. Speak the truth in love. Let's be who we are. We have a long history of faithfulness behind us. May God make us in this place um, a lighthouse of truth. Lord, we thank you for the faithfulness of Naboth and others whom we have studied. We thank you for Jack Phillips and Beryl Stutzman and many, many others who are at the risk of their, their own earthly lives and, some, and all that they've earned and worked for are standing up the rights for, even of the, for the rights even of their enemies. And we pray that you would protect us from this scourge of totalitarianism that is upon us. But even if that comes, or even if, if that is what we deserve, and we end up under that, help us to stand. And that you would count us worthy if it, ne if it be necessary to suffer for the sake of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you all. Have a good day.